Thanks everyone for joining us at the Project Censored radio show. We're very glad right now to be joined once again on the show by Professor Richard Wolf, who's a professor emeritus of economics at the University of Massachusetts Amherst. He is currently a visiting professor at the New School University in New York. He's also the co-founder of democracyatwork.info and its weekly radio and TV show Economic Update. You can find more of his work at democracyatwork.info and rdwolf with two fs.com. Dr. Wolf, thank you so much for joining us. I'm very, very glad to be here, Eleanor. I really enjoy speaking with you. Likewise. Thank you. So I wanted to ask you about the economics of this corporate hack of quote unquote tiered workers. Uh, right. This is something that we see cropping up all over the place. UPS workers were demanding an end to the two-tiered system, they called it, that included a massive wage differential between full-time and part-time workers and between drivers and inside workers. A recent post by A More Perfect Union outlines the way that temp workers at Jeep make half the rate of full-time employees, though they do the same jobs, with some workers having been temp for more than five years with no clear path to becoming full employees. So I wanted to start us off by asking you to talk a bit more about this trend, what it means for the corporations, and what it thereby means for the workers. Okay, I'm glad to do that. I, let me just add that one of the key issues in the strike right now between the United Auto Workers and the Ford, GM, and Stellantis is precisely the two-tier system that was put in place a few years ago and is violently objected to by, by the workers. Let me approach this historically, which, which will set the tone for it. Karl Marx once wrote that the history of the, of the world is the history of class struggle, whether it's master and slave, lord and serf, employer, employee, it's always the same. And what he meant was if you organize workplaces, like factories or offices or stores, if you organize them with a small number of people at the top, the major shareholders, the board of directors, the owner operator, and then below them, a mass of employees, you're going to have endless tension because what, what the employer wants is the maximum profit out of those employees. What the employees want is a decent income to raise their families, to live their lives, to have what is nowadays called a decent work-life balance, et cetera, et cetera. And these are conflicting goals. The employer gets more profit the more he squeezes the workers. And the workers fighting for better lives for themselves find themselves opposed by the employer who doesn't want to give them that. This is a, a struggle without end. And now we have the context, two tiers is a way of engaging in that struggle and should not be misunderstood for being anything else. Here's what it means. The employers have figured out that they have a better chance of squeezing their workers to get more profit out of them by setting them against each other, by finding ways to provoke or to worsen if they're already there, arguments, disagreements, suspicions, all of it. And we, we see it everywhere. Male against female, older worker, younger worker, white worker, worker of color, and I could go on and on. But they're creative. They don't just deal with the old inherited conflicts like those I just mentioned. They've decided to add a few of their own. And one of them is the tiered worker system. Here's how it works. Workers now, in the working right now at this moment, whenever that moment is, are told by the employer, we don't want to make life difficult for you. We will continue to pay you the wages that we've been paying you. No problem. All we ask is that you allow us to hire new workers when you die, when you take a different job, when you retire, whatever, when we replace you, we want to have the right to bring in the young worker, the new worker, 
at a lower wage than we pay you. And But of course, since we believe in democracy, we're going to give you the vote in your union whether or not to accept doing this. Notice that no vote is given to the unknown people to be hired later. So they who might say, no, 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 no. If I'm going to be doing the same work as somebody else, I want to get the same pay. They're not allowed to vote by this little arrangement. Who does the voting? Only the workers that are there now, because they're the ones in the union who get to vote. Now, they may have a feeling that they don't want to do to the younger generation what was not done to them by the generation before them. Two-tier is a relatively new gambit. So a lot of those workers won't go for that because they understand what I just said. But a bunch of others who don't know their history, no one has taken them aside to teach them, no one is there doing it now. If you have a corrupt union leadership, it kind of goes along with all of this. And at least immediately, the older workers won't notice it because they're continuing to get paid. So they are able sometimes to get that, like get one by on the employees who actually vote to accept the contract with two tiers. But as the United Auto Workers shows, once they understand and see it, once the older workers recognize the lesson, if you want those younger workers to go out on strike when it's important for you, then you're not going to get the kind of support you want if you have taught those workers not to trust you because you went along with a deal that gives them half the pay you get for doing the exact same work. And the same applies to temp workers, which is just another way of doing the same thing. I like to talk about it not only to teach people not to be fooled, but because it's a lesson that the class struggle that our mainstream media avoid referring to on pain of near death. They'll say all those seven words that uh, Carlin told us never to say. They'll do. They'll they'll punish that. They'll deal with all. But to say class struggle, well, that that's much worse than any of those seven words, which I know not to say. It, it, the hypocrisy is grotesque here. But that's what we're looking at. We're looking at class struggle in our moment of history. And I think you're seeing the United Auto Workers saying, no, you're not, fool us once, maybe. You're not gonna fool us twice. We're not gonna do this. We're gonna fight against that. And I noticed there are a number of other unions that are beginning to really push back. They're learning that this is not only good for the employer, it's bad for the union and all the solidarity that they would want. So they lose twice from this deal. Right, an injury to one is an injury to all. Yeah. And and since you mentioned the UAW, I'm curious what your thoughts are because there's been a lot of back and forth with people arguing about the tactic, tactic of this partial strike. Uh, and I'm curious, what are your thoughts on the partial strike as a tactic? <clears throat> well, I, I shy away from too much commentary on these tactics. And the, not because it isn't an important topic, it is. It's just, we can't know. The way these things are done, there's a small room in some hotel somewhere where the representatives of the auto companies are sitting across the table from the, represent, the union leaders of the union negotiating team. And probably in the room, either physically or spiritually, is a President Biden. And people should be very clear, he's there because he's worried about his election next year, as he should be. And he figures out he's going to be in trouble depending on how this strike goes. So, for example, and I'm not saying this is what happened because I don't know. I wasn't in that room and nobody who was in that room has spoken to me. So this is purely my guesswork. But here's my guesswork, that the union probably understood that its best leverage would be to take all 150,000 workers out at the same time, which is 
at midnight last Thursday, okay? Um, Mr. Biden would have preferred a settlement the way the Teamsters settled with the United Parcel Service a few weeks earlier. They compromised. What Biden got was there will be a strike. You know, we're not going to call the strike off. But what Mr. Biden got was this approach of we'll start with three or four plants. And if we don't get a response from the employer, then we will broaden it out. Um, that's the kind of thing that often happens because you really have all three. The minute the union gets large, then the politicians, if it's not the president, well, then it's the senator or the governor, uh, depending on the size and the number of voters affected and the publicity the thing gets, you'll see a different, uh, but that's the way our society uh, kind of works. And the union may also have had other reasons. It's very hard, people have to understand, it's very hard to take workers out on strike. Remember, the, the the unfairness of it, I'll take just General Motors, for example. Their uh, CEO, Mary Barra, you know, was revealed during the last two weeks to ha have a salary currently of $29 million a year, a salary that went up uh, on average, the auto executives top, went on, uh, up about 40% over the last four or five years. So, I mean, these people are rolling in money, just, just rolling, number one. Number two, the strike does not affect their income. They, they continue to be paid if the strike lasts two days, two weeks, two months, don't make any difference. Think how utterly different the other side of the table is. These are workers who are on strike because they're not getting paid enough faced with the inflation, faced with the rising interest rates on the credit cards they all carry, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. They are people that are being squeezed. And now for every hour they're out on strike, they lose money because the strike pay from the union is significantly less than their pay. So they are taking it on the chin every day. And if you're the union leader, even if you're relatively militant sounding, as Sean Fain, the new head just elected of the union, uh, is, uh, you don't want to take your people out and subject them to that. So you have to worry that a lot of workers are going to feel, rightly or wrongly, that you should have tried at least with a few factories at the beginning so that the others wouldn't have to suffer if that would be enough. So he's going to wait a week give the company a chance, the company, you know, says no, okay, then he'll say, that may be more acceptable to his members. All of those kinds of considerations are there. But I want to stress the basic point. Labor management negotiations of this kind are really negotiation between David and Goliath. And David is the worker and Goliath is the employer. And the question is whether the strike is a slingshot or not. Uh, a, a very good metaphor. Um, well, and I, I, I'm also curious about that because you mentioned, you know, the the sitting the the Teamsters working uh, to to figure out this contract with the UPS, and a lot of people particularly uh, obviously on the left, said, well, that wasn't good enough. There was so much about the, their demands that weren't met. Uh, the rail workers ended up not going on strike, thanks to, as you mentioned, Biden <laughs> basically saying that it would be illegal to do so. And yeah. I'm curious about that, the the class structure that also exists inside unions. You know, a lot of people were then pointing at the, 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 the heads of the union saying, well, you didn't push hard enough. You didn't, you didn't demand hard enough. What is your perspective on that? Understanding just as uh, just as you said as well that it's a difficult thing to decide because pulling people on strike is also very damaging yeah i mean the, the union leaders are in a tough position are there some who are corrupted and basically serve as organizers of the workforce for the employer the answer is yes there are such 
union leaders, and therefore every union member in any union is always worried whether he or she admits it or not, are my leaders that way? And I hope not. That's why there are hotly contested uh, races as there were in the UAW. And Sean Fain, the new leader who won by very little, we're talking 100, 150,000 votes. He won by 400 and some votes. So this was a, he's got to show that he really is the better one because an awful lot of people in that union are going to be skeptical, the ones that voted for the other side, which was more the traditional leadership. Uh, on the other hand, you know, we subject unions to things we do not subject uh, managers to. Unions have to show that they have democratic elections uh, in which each union member has a vote, an equal vote, one union member, one vote. The people who elect the board of directors of General Motors don't have that democracy. They are not elected by anyone other than the shareholders, number one, everybody else, even, you know, the, the citizens of Detroit are deeply affected by whatever happens here. Those who work at the, you know, the auto plants, but the, but the many hundred thousand who don't, what say do they have? They have to live with the results of this outcome, but they have no vote at it at all. But even worse is once you look at the vote, it turns out that the shareholders have a vote per share that they own, not a vote per person, which means, to give you an example, that any of the large major banks in this country, Citibank, Bank of America, Wells Fargo, Chase uh, Morgan Bank, they are the trustees for large blocks of stock that are owned by wealthy corporations, wealthy individuals. So they come into the annual meeting with, get ready now, hundreds of millions of votes. One banker, Banker John or Banker Mary, comes in there and votes a million times. Your grandmother, who might have gotten a gift at some point in her life of 10 shares of General Motors, she gets 10 votes. But she doesn't bother knowing about it or going to the meeting because she knows her votes mean nothing. If you talk to grandma, and this is not because grandma isn't smart or grandma that isn't educated about these things. Grandma, if she's smart and educated, knows that spending her money to go to the meeting of the board of the of the annual shareholders meeting is an utter and complete waste of her time because her votes are completely overwhelmed. A tiny group of people, and let me stress this, often it's 30 to, I've been to meetings of annual shareholders, 30 or 40 people are in the room and the outstanding shares, 50 million. So those 30 people are voting the shares of the 50 million. It, it, it's disgusting. So you have the union, which has to, is supervised by the government, National Labor Relations Board, it must adhere to democratic rules in which one person has one vote and you can't mess around with that in the union election. On the other hand, you have a very cozy system of 30, 40, 50 people, all of whom know each other, all of whom gather in the same room at that hotel. You know, it's like a picnic or, or a family reunion where they all get together they know what they do. They do the same thing. They go through it. I sat there go, on proposition number four. How many people are in favor? 30 hands go up. How many people are against? Two people who are there because there's free drinks. You know, it, it's a joke. It has nothing to do with democratic governance. It is the way our corporations and they do the bulk of the business. That's the way that they work. So it. It really is David and Goliath. It really is a completely bizarre way. And so the, the corporate leadership does what they want. And they're not, I mean, you could even make an argument. I, I'll, I'll be a little bit, I'll go a little further. The union is at least a large number of people. On the other side, it's a tiny group of people. And you, the two of them get together to decide what happens? Unfair conversation, unequal situation, really grotesque. 
But then there's the millions of people who are going to be affected by the outcome, who have no say whatsoever. You know, it's a little bit like explaining to people that an inflation is one of the most undemocratic phenomena one can imagine. The percentage of our population, if you allow me for a minute, Eleanor, with this, the percentage of our population that are employers is estimated between one and 3% of our people are in the position of hiring and firing people, being an employer. The rest of us are either employees or the dependents and relatives of employees. Okay, who sets the prices for the goods and services we all depend on? whether the haircut we get or the blouse we buy or the hamburger we, we, we get at the store, it's those 3% of the people. Let's be like, let's say 3%. They decide whether the price goes up, whether the price goes down, or whether the price stays the same. They make that decision. The rest of us pay. We're upset these days because they're raising the price. Did we vote for that? Of course not. Do we have any input on it? None. No employer calls the employees in to participate in deciding what the price is of the hamburger or the blouse or the haircut. So when prices go up, I want people to understand it's like with that negotiation between the union and the employer. The prices are being raised by a tiny group of people at the top who seem to have in this weird system we call capitalism, have this authority to impose on the rest of us the inflation. And when we complain about the inflation, if the system has done its job, we will blame anything or everyone other than the people who did it. So it'll be supply chain disruptions, or it'll be the nasty Russians invading Ukraine, or it will be the nastier Chinese doing something. But the idea of asking the question, when a price goes up, who raised it? We don't do that. We don't do that. Yeah, it's extraordinary. The power of ideology coming home to roost. Yeah, absolutely. It, it reminds me of the, the the example of Walmart having a little collection tin so that their workers can afford food or, you know, the fact that many of their workers are on the SNAP program. Right. And how how long would it take for someone to go down the list of things to get to, why don't you just pay your workers more? <laughs> yeah, yeah I'm, not only that, I've heard this story, I've never verified it myself, but I'm sure it's true that in some of the Walmart stores and other stores too, there is an, uh, uh, a desk with a person hired, paid by Walmart, you know, a regular wage. And what that person knows are how to get SNAP, how to get food stamps of one kind or another. And the rest of the employees at Walmart or any other store are encouraged on their way in in the morning or on their way out in the evening to stop by that desk and get some help. And of course, the logic for Walmart is then they can get away with paying these people too little because they're using those people's desperation to basically force the government into subsidizing the wage. And here's the best part. You will then see the conservatives to whom Walmart donates denouncing the government for subsidizing, not understanding that the reason the government does it is because Walmart wants it. You know, it, it, if you understand the way this capitalism works, all you end up doing, which is me, is shaking your head and saying, how the heck do the American people tolerate this? Absolutely. That's a, a, a great question that I ask myself a lot. And and with that, I wanted to, to ask kind of a broader question here, because you talk about, and indeed it's the name of name of your site, Democracy at Work. And I'm curious, do you feel 
that any demands that fall short of that, you know, speaking about demands with regards to, the, to, to strikes that might happen, any demands that fall short of a full democratization of the workplace, i.e. worker ownership, can actually address the deep needs and the root causes, i.e. capitalism? Uh, or is this just putting a Band-Aid band on a gunshot wound and hoping that it'll see us through? Well, in the past, I might have hesitated with your metaphor, but I, I believe it's correct now. I, I think what we're seeing um, in the UPS strike, in the UAW strike, whatever the outcome, you're going to be leaving a sizable residue of the members, of the workers, both those who voted for the contract and those who voted against it, a sizable proportion are going to feel, as you just said, that whatever the settlement was, it falls far short of what we need and what we want. And I let me push this, that sentiment, is my best hope for how we're going to go beyond this. And let me explain. I have been involved in the following scene. A group of workers demand an improvement in their working conditions and their wages. Uh, the employer refuses for whatever reason. The workers go on strike or threaten to go on strike. It doesn't matter. And the employer counters and says, and by the way, the, the auto company executives are saying this right now, so I could use them as an example. Uh, we cannot meet your demands because if we could, if we met your demands, we, uh, we would sooner close the business because it's an unviable business, it's unsustainable, and nobody will buy a Ford or a GM car if we give you the wages you demand. And, and then we'll die. Uh, we'll close the factory. Or maybe a, a variation, we'll leave and move the factory to China, or we'll move it to Brazil or Mexico or Canada. It doesn't matter. At this point, something happens which most Americans have not yet been able to imagine, which is my job to help you do that. Um, the workers say to the manager, no problem, go. We don't need you. We don't want you. We're sick and tired of every two or three years having this crazy ritual where we say we need this to get by. It's obvious we've had a terrible inflation. Our wages haven't gone up. Who's surprised that we are arriving saying, hey, we got to get more money. We can't get our kids to college. We can't put food on the table, etc." You go. We'll take this place over and run it as a worker co-op. You know, one of the advantages of worker co-ops is they don't have to pay dividends to anybody because it's their business. They don't have to have executives like you, Mary Barra, with $29 million. We can get someone to be a supervisor here for a tiny fraction of what we're paying you. And you know something? If it's our enterprise, we have a wholly different attitude towards it. When we leave at the end of the day, we make sure to turn the light off in the bathroom so it doesn't go all night charging us electric bills. And we make sure that the faucet works and doesn't drip. And we make sure to oil the machinery. And we make sure that, ooh, we're going to be more productive because we care, it's our, it's the same logic as saying, if it's your apartment, you take better care of it than if it isn't. Or if it's your you know, pet, you take better care of it than if it's somebody else's pet, et cetera, et cetera. So go already. And you know something? This is gonna change labor capital relationships in this country. Suddenly the workers have another weapon. They don't just have job action. They don't just have a strike. They can say, hey, you close it, we'll take it over. But now it gets better. I have helped arrange for those workers when they're in that situation to go to the local mayor or the local senator or the local governor and say, here's our situation. 
we are going to demand it. They're going to shut the factory or, or threaten to take it. And we're going to say, look at them. These are bad citizens. They're closing the factory. They're depriving all people of work. They're depriving the community of the taxes they pay. They are the bad guys. We, the workers, who are going to keep this business going, thereby keep the salaries being paid, the wages, keep the taxes being paid. We're the heroes. We're good for this community. They're not. We want you, the politician, to help us. Give us a subsidy. Give us a tax break. Give us the things that will make this work. And if you do that, we will be big supporters of yours. And the other message, if you don't do it, you won't be dog catcher around here. Because we are going to make sure everyone knows you could have saved the economic situation, but you didn't. This, this is a game changer. This is a new politics. This is a new economics. And for the workers, it's a moment of empowerment they never dreamed they would have. They are now the big shots. They are the people who are the employer and the employee. That split is no longer there. They are their own bosses, which has been their dream ever since they were children to be their own boss. I used to ask in my lectures at UMass, I used to ask, I sometimes taught classes of five, 600 people, and I would have them write down, what do you hope to do in the years ahead? Overwhelming majority of young men and women wrote, I want to be my own boss. I don't want to sit in a cubicle in some anonymous building, you know, indistinguishable from the people around me. So we are responding to that desire of people to the empowerment people will not give up once they get a taste of it. And so I think the conditions are ripening for the very ideas of transition I'm talking about to become major ways of thinking for large numbers of people. Yeah, absolutely. And basically, I, I like you said earlier, the, the, the trick is knowing that you have those tools in your toolkit. That's right. You know, it's the old lesson, the lesson that people of color have had to learn, women have had to learn in our culture. You have the power. It's the question of whether you can figure out how, together with others, you can exercise that power, make it. You don't have to be a second class citizen. And in the workplace, the employees are second class citizens and they have to learn. Look. The, the, the anti-racism movement, the anti-sexism movement borrowed things like the sit-down strikes from labor back in the 30s. Okay, now it's going to go the other way. The labor movement's going to be revived by learning the lessons of the social movements to stand up and to refuse to do this and refuse to accept that and to demand a different way of functioning. Everybody used to think it was reasonable that all the executives were male. And they all had a female secretary, as if this were somehow written in the stars. And nowadays, right, we make fun of all of that. We mock it. We, I mean, some of us do, but it, 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 at least the direction is in the right in the right way. I don't see any reason why employees cannot do to the employer what was done by people of color to teach white people. And will there be a, a, a backlash? Of course. Look at the white supremacy stuff now look at the hostility towards women coming up all over the place you know I, I, the difference people have who have seen the film barbie who see it in one way or another i find this spectacular two people sitting right next to each other in the same theater watching that same movie over the same whatever it is hour and a half coming out <laughs> with the most diametrical notions of what they just experienced, and then laughing when they realize how differently that this film unfolded in their minds. You know, one who went to see the Barbie that my wife and I would not buy for our daughter years ago, versus, you know, versus the people who thought this movie is about that Barbie, rather than a takedown of that whole idea. I mean, it's, it's wonderful. Yes, there is no consensus reality these days, for sure. No. 
Well, Dr. Wolf, thank you so much for taking the time to once again, as you always do, contextualize things and explain it in a way that people like me who are economic idiots understand. Really appreciate it. It's my pleasure. You know, I became a teacher because I had one too many experiences with people who said they were a teacher, but could not, as we used to say, teach their way out of a paper bag is able to just, you know, they weren't made for it. They didn't understand it. No one ever taught it to them. And I swore to myself, I really did. If I ever get into that line of work, I am not going to subject students to the experience that was imposed on me all those years. The job of the teacher is to make it understandable. And if you're not doing that, you should be doing something else. Agree. And not just understandable, but enticing. And I never thought that I would be interested in economics, but I listened to your show and I think my old econ teacher would probably fall backwards out of surprise if he knew that. <laughs> <laughs> so <Okay>. thank you. <laughs> my, my pleasure. Thank you very much, Eleanor.